It is so nice to see all of your smiling faces on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. I wanted to take a moment to remind you of a few things. Uh, first things first, we are coming to the close of our worship series um, on the deeper self. So just to recap, we've learned about the deeper self and a deeper hope a deeper resilience, and today we'll be focusing on the image of God, or the Imago Dei. So this Thursday, we invite you as well to join us on our walking groups. Um, take the conversation a little bit further, um, something that really stuck out to you in here, something that you want to learn more about, and come join the Board of Stewards. We want to walk with you through your journey of faith. Uh, join us this weekend for our alumni memorial service this Sunday at 10 a.m. right here in the chapel. And finally, uh, join us next Wednesday in chapel as we'll participate in blessing those who serve. So if you are serving over fall break or if you know someone that is, please come and we'll lay hands on them and we'll bless all of you. So now as we begin to center ourselves into this time of worship, let us begin by taking one deep breath together. And another. Relaxing into our inner selves or the Imago Dei. So now God, as we rest in the stillness of your presence, we ask that you would Help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Help us to be transformed by the renewing. Help us to be transformed. Help us to be. These things we pray in your name. Amen.
Would everyone open their bulletins to where it says the invocation? We are about to enter into a time of collective prayer. Um, so as we pray, I invite you to listen for the words, Lord, in your mercy. And when you hear those words, I'd like to, you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. So can we try that together? Lord, in your mercy. So I invite you now, everyone, to stand up. And come forwards to the center, to the front of the chapel. Come out of your rows, out of the balcony, and into the aisles. You can even fill the pulpit, but just join me here in the center. <laughs> when you reach the front of the chapel, I invite you to fill the space as tightly as you can. So come a little closer if you're in the aisles. Come a little closer if you're in the pulpit or surrounding. <laughs> so when you find a place of rest, I invite you to touch those standing around you. I invite you to touch those standing around you so that when we pray, our prayers would come from the center of this connected and collective collection of people. So let us pray together. Come Holy Spirit, be present with us in this moment of sadness, disbelief, neutrality, anger, and remind us that those feelings and those emotions are still welcomed in your sight. God, in this moment, we wait in stillness and in reverence for you. So Lord, in your mercy, we lift our hearts and our voices to you in solidarity with those who are still affected by the tragedy that occurred on Sunday in Las Vegas. We remember the 59 victims that are now dead and the over 500 injured who will now add to their own scars, the scars of someone else's pain, someone else's sorrow, anger, and confusion. God, we even pray for those who are still putting the pieces of their homes back together those who are still experiencing the aftermath of the most recent hurricanes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray not only for the physical and emotional healing of those injured, but we also pray for spiritual assistance in all forms, encouragement, the courage to move forward, and somehow and in some way, to forgive. And as we remember the prophet Isaiah, we cry out to you in a similar way, asking that you would comfort, comfort your people, O oh Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We also pray for those who have been appointed to lead, that they would be filled with honesty, humility, wisdom and love and, and that it would carry over into the decisions they will ultimately make to ensure and maintain the safety, the care, the well-being, dignity and unity of all people in their care. God, we pray for, for churches in the Las Vegas area that they would be filled with courage and compassion, strength and love and openness as they begin or continue to serve all of your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
Finally, Lord, I pray that after these moments, after we've prayed with one another, that we wouldn't just go back to our daily routines without first being called to see, being called to listen to, to respect, to care for, to love and support those whom we touch right now, those who we are standing right beside, right in front of our eyes on this campus and in this city. May the love that we have within ourselves and all of humanity overwhelm the pain and the hate that we seem to feel and see too often. May the love that is in you be the well that we draw from as we share with those who are living among us. May we be the answers to one another's prayers and let the love that we have within ourselves and within you be the example we use and the motivation that drives us to serve those who are here and those who are far away. And if we are lacking in love as we will be at times, remind us that you will be there to fill us up again. God, if we are lacking in hope, remind us that it is your hands that will hold us eternally. Lord, in your mercy, You are here, O oh God, right now in this very room. And even in this bleak, fearful, heartbreaking time, as we touch one another, as we hold one another's hands, let us rest assured, knowing that it is your hand that we ultimately feel. Remind us of your presence again, so that when we leave this place, we will know, and we will have the confidence to say that you are indeed with us, Remind us that we are one right now. And if we are one in this moment, that we can still be one when we leave this place. Oh Lord, in your mercy. For even as we say, surely the darkness shall cover us and the light around us become night. May we have faith that even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. We pray this prayer in your name because you were the one who was and is light in the darkness. You are the one whom night could not consume. It is you, O oh God, Christ our Lord. Amen. So friends, as you head back to your seats, still stand one more time. We're not quite done. As you um, heard Dr. Foster say in the music that was sung, and, and the, the chamber singer saying, I may not know you, but I love you. I may not know you, but I miss you. Or as Jesus put it, uh, we are one. And so you may not know the people here in this pews. You may not know everybody. But uh, what we do each week when we come here is we do something called passing the peace of Christ. And it's to remind those who come in these doors that they are loved more than they know even if you don't know each other. So I ask you to get outside your pews one more time. I tried to do this before we got all back to our pews, but turn to one another and welcome one another with the peace of Christ and tell somebody you're glad to see them.
Hello, everyone. Continue to stand. My name is Brianna. Um, can you please join me, uh, open up your hymnal to page 351 to uh, sing with me, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. All of us will sing verses 1 and 4 in the refrain. The women will sing verses 2, and the men will sing verse 3. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tristan Payne. I am the president of the Pi Kappa Phi fraternity. Um, and as a fraternity, we pride ourselves a lot on our philanthropy, so I would like to discuss that with you a little tonight. Um, our philanthropy is the Ability Experience, and it is the only philanthropy owned and run by a national fraternity. Um, it's to help people with disabilities. And recently, we started a partnership with the Miracle League here in High Point, And last Friday was our first volunteering opportunity with them. Uh, we will be continuing that. Um, also, October 23rd and 24th in the Wannock Center, we will be having a bike-a-thon, um, and that's to raise awareness for people with disabilities, but also to raise money. Last year, with our bike-a-thon and our philanthropy week, we were able to raise $10,000 for the Ability Experience, um, which was our biggest year yet. Um, and if anybody would like to volunteer at the Miracle League with us, um, we're done for this semester, unfortunately, but next semester we'll be doing it four times. So. Just get in contact with me or anyone in our fraternity, and we'd love to have you guys out there. Thank you very much.
Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Blair Thurman, and I'm from the Board of Stewards. And first, we just want to thank you all for coming. Um, as everyone knows, we always do kind of like a service project each semester. And during the fall, we work towards raising money to provide children for gifts through the Angel Tree Project, um, through the Salvation Army. This year, our goal is to provide gifts for 150 children, and we need about $15,000 to do that. So far, we have only raised a little over $2,000, but to reach our goal, we need your help. So I ask that tonight that you please give everything that you can, whether it be as little or as much, and we thank you for that so much. We also want you to know that we have been praying over your prayer requests every week, and. We want you to be open about your prayer requests. If there's anything on your heart that you want the Lord to know that wants to come through us, then please write that down on the sheets inside your bulletins and find a board member, Preston or Andrea, after the service and give that to them. And that's it. And thank you, everyone.
Sisters and brothers, we have seen dark times with the prayers you brought to us, the Board of Stewards, to hold in our hearts and minds, with the hurricanes and their destructive forces leaving our friends and family homeless, injured, or killed, with the earthquake that devastates our brothers and sisters in Mexico, and with the most recent shooting in Las Vegas, we cannot help but lament the suffering we see in this world. We feel like it is the end of the world as we try to find peace and love in a world so filled with the din of violence and hate. But we are not alone in this struggle against suffering or evil. Friends, we, our ancestors in the faith, continue to face this. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi, a devout disciple who lived almost a thousand years ago, prays for the peace that we seek today. And please pray with me and our ancestors in faith, and may the Holy Spirit fill you with the peace and power of God, the ability to flip the darkness we face now and bring forth the glorious light of God's presence. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Please pray as Jesus taught us in the Gospels. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the power, and the glory. Amen. Our scripture for today comes from two passages. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 15, and Romans 12, verse 2. Psalm 139 says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go for your spirit? Oh, where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, and even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weightly to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them, and they are more than sand. I come to the end, I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? 
And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. One more round of applause for chamber singers. Um, yeah. So... I don't know if you heard everything that Anne Marie said in that psalm. It's got the full breadth of human emotion in it, doesn't it? From pleading to, uh, a plea to God to be saved, to also a plea to end one's enemies, right? Like someone once said about the psalms, I love this, uh, what the psalms do, they help you cuss without cussing. They've got the full range of emotion, and we might say like, well, you shouldn't feel that way, but what if you feel that way? There's something comforting for me about Scripture that it's all in there. Everything that you might have ever imagined or experienced or felt, it's right there. And that God can handle all of it. It's wonderful. Uh, I want to say a little bit more about this psalm because this is one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 139. Uh, just sort of the end of it, right? Like, for it was you who formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, tonight, what we're going to talk about for the next like 20 minutes is this last part in the series of about figuring out how do we answer the question, who am I? And what the psalm is doing is saying, I remember who I am because of a God who remembers me. And so we feel like, I feel like the last two weeks has been leading up to this kind of answer to the question, who am I? So just a reminder, if you haven't been here the last couple weeks, this has been a series that MJ, MJ hey, say hey to MJ. Hey, hey folks. We did that last couple weeks, so I wanted to continue it. Um, MJ is the executive director of counseling, and we want to talk about this rise in uh, mental illness and rise in understanding mental health. Uh, from a therapeutic side and a theological side, and how these are like two sides of one coin. It can be really helpful in understanding this. So first week we talked about um, depression and suicide, but really about deeper hope that can be found. Uh, last week we talked about how we might have more grit, uh, more resilience, and a recognition that when we go through um, when we go through times of trial or struggle, there's like three things that often happen: personalization, um, uh, personalization, per- pervasiveness, and permanence. Right. And if you can recognize those things are going to happen each time that kind of can keep you from moving along, you can do battle with them. Uh, but still, the, kind of the question I think MJ and I run up against almost all the time where a lot of anxiety comes from and how we make meaning in our lives is this question. Who am I? Right? And I think that's the thing that a lot of it, I talk with you all about, like, who am I becoming? And how do we answer that question? And so what are some of the things you see when people are trying to answer the question, who am I? I think it's one of those common denominators that people seek out spiritual help for, but also therapeutic help of creating meaning in their life and asking that question, who am I? So I want to take a second, and before we go any further, have you answered that question? If you have pencils on you, just flip over the prayer card and kind of put a quick note on the prayer card before we share. How do you answer that question, who am I? Take 30 seconds. Take 30 seconds. You can do this. It's hard for me to sit in one place. I'm tempted to start walking around. So if I walk around, I'll make you nervous. <laughs> but I think that eternal question of who am I creating meaning is one of the most important questions we ask ourselves. But I'll challenge you to think about who you are today and know that that's a journey and the beginning of a journey of who we are. So a couple weeks ago, it was family weekend, and I was, I was preaching on this. Um, there's a story of Jacob wrestling with an angel with God in the wilderness, and, and, and God asks, what's your name? And what we know about Old Testament scripture is a name had to do with the center of a person. Uh, and I, I, I discovered this a couple of years ago when I was doing research. Um, there's a couple of you who were in my Intro to Christianity class, and you're in here. And I, asked the, and I showed this, that like, your name actually has much more significance than you think. And I found out years later, or a few years ago that Preston means priest town. It's like I never had a choice. I was like always going to be a pastor. It wasn't fair. Destined. It wasn't fair. But the question that God asked Jacob is, what is your name? And really, at a fundamental que- uh, the fundamental basis, he's asking, who are you? And Jacob can't really answer the question. And he gets a name change that day trying to figure out, well, who am I? And here's the cool thing from, I think, both of our sides. I, and I don't know if you look down at your notes. 
how you answer that question. But from neuroscience, from biology to spirituality, when it comes down how you answer that question, it's a story you tell yourself. It's a story of, of you saying, this is who I am. Do you want to say any more about sure. this? Sure. I mean, so the example I often use is we define who we are in the world, and, and that shapes not only how we see the world and how we see ourselves with others, it actually reformats our brain, which is part of what we're going to talk about is the neurobiology of how our neural pathways, our brain plasticity, how it changes and moves, actually changes in how we think and how we tell our story. So a simple example, if I get a C on an exam, if I think of myself, I am a good student, I am a smart person, I'm going to look at that C and I might think, oh, I've got to study harder, I didn't take that as seriously as I should have, maybe I misunderstood a question, let me go for some extra help, I know I can do better on this because I'm, I'm smart and I know I can do this. If I'm someone who looks at that C and I'm thinking, I'm worthless, I'm not very valued, I'm not very smart, I've been told my whole life I'm not very smart, so I've got to see, yeah, that's what I expect, why bother trying? Now it's the same C, but what's the difference between those two perspectives? One is someone who sees themselves and it's just their own internal monologue. I am good at this, I'm a good student. And the other person is seeing themselves as I'm not a good student. Same exact grade. So what changes that? The narrative of how we see ourselves. If I say I'm a healthy person, I'm pretty upbeat, I'm pretty happy, then guess what? I'm gonna be pretty healthy, pretty upbeat, and pretty happy. If I see myself as someone who is down and worthless, I say those words over and over to myself. That negative self-talk gets repeated thousands of hours of repetition. And sure enough, our brain responds to that. The neurons that connect to that language actually grow. And other neurons die off. So it gets harder to reformat that brain as we get older and older. So there's a real physiology to it. And the interesting thing is, as we were all listening to that music, if I had an MRI machine, what I would see is all of your brains lighting up in the same exact places. So your motor cortex, your sensory cortex, and for music, we also have Broca's area and Wernicke's area, which are our language processing, right? Music lights up lots of our brain. And so what I would have seen is all of your brains being lit up in the same way. Why? Because we understand and take the world in in very much the same way. So when I tell you a story, and I say, I grabbed Preston's hand, and it was very leathery. It's not true. It's all, but I'm just all the time. Saying, That's exactly how people describe lumberjack. my hands. <laughs> but I'm just saying, the minute I say the word leathery, what happens? Your sensory cortex engages. And that was true with every single brain in this room. You went to the sensation of, what is leathery? Oh, yeah, that's right. I know what that feels like. If I tell you I'm watching a soccer game, and, uh, you know, Pueblo hit the ball and, and had a goal, you know, part of your brain lights up? The motor cortex. And that's true for every person sitting in this room. Me telling the story, my motor cortex lights up. So what's happening there? Our brain understands language in the world around us, and we all respond to it the same way. Now, what happened there? We're exercising parts of our brain. And there's certain neural pathways that have been created since we were newborn and took our first breath, actually, truth be told, before that when our brain develops. Um, but we use certain pathways, and if we don't use others, they die off. A good example is if we lived a very traumatic childhood. And I hope that's not true for anyone here, but it's what's called ACEs, acquired childhood experiences. And if we have a lot of negative childhood experiences, we become hypervigilant, and we be very aware of our surroundings. It might be triggered by people who look like certain people. So what's happening is that part of our brain that's hypervigilant was the part of our brain that was overactivated in childhood. So now, those neural pathways are done. They're in there, and there's a lot of them. Other neural pathways, like the neural pathways that light up when someone hugs us, might not have gotten as much attention. So what happens when you grow up? You become an adult, you've got a brain that's very hyperreactive, but maybe not so comfortable with this touching thing, right? So how does that affect you as an adult? So we have to think about these experiences that we have in childhood, how they affect our body and our brain and how we understand the world today, from our C that we got in our math class. Notice I added math. That probably changed how some of you thought about it. And what our experiences are and the lenses we use. Here's the upside. We can change that. 
So when I run into someone, and this happens all the time, who says to themselves their, their self-talk, because we all have self-talk in the back of our heads, and sometimes it's the voice of our mother, sometimes it's the voice of someone we cared about, sometimes it's just our own negative thoughts. But we have those thoughts in the back of our head that say, I'm not very smart, I'm worthless, I'm not valuable, I'm stupid, why am I here? And those voices become very strong. And what we have to do is stop them and say, whoa, whoa, that's just my fear talking, that's just my negative experience, or that's just my depression. But the truth is, I am smart, I am worthy, I am valued because I'm just me. I am who I am and that's worthy and that's valuable. But the key is, you have to have how many hours of practice, right? You've had how many thousands of hours of telling yourself you're worthless? You need X number of hours telling yourself, no, I'm worthy. So really remapping and reformatting the brain, as strange as it sounds. So this is where physiology so, and spirituality become very so, interesting. Like you came to chapel tonight and you like probably didn't expect anything like what you just heard right here. But here's, like, here's like what I get excited about as a pastor when I hear her talk about that. Yeah. Did you hear what Anne Marie read when she heard when she read Paul's words? Don't conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he's talking about something this ancient this is two thousand years ago, talking about like what you put in your mind will become what shapes you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He even says in the places we are not slaves to this kind of behavior anymore, we have the mind of Christ. He starts talking about like this is what gets me really excited, like what are the habits of that you're saying to yourself? What is your prayer life like? Like there's this theologian who says like we typically only pray when we're in trouble, but we're in trouble all the time and we don't know it. And so what would prayer might look like is a, di- a continual dialogue with who we might be called to be. Like Paul also says like you pray without ceasing. That's not being on bended knee all the time praying. It's the internal monologue you have or dialogue with God about who you hope to become. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said, uh, he said, our prayers aren't always to change God's mind, they're to change our minds, right? That's often when we come in here and I ask you all to pay attention to the Lord's Prayer, because often we just say it without hearing it, but Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's like a really powerful prayer, not about transformation somewhere beyond, but somewhere right now, here, now, beginning with the brain. I don't think that's, I don't know, I get really excited thinking about like the brain, like that God knows that our brains can be reshaped and has given us these great tools that can be reshaped by the stories we tell ourselves. And the stories do shape our brains. Um, if we all listen to the same story and do an MRI, our brains literally will be in sync. The parts where we're activated will all activate together. The parts where we're kind of quiet will all be quiet together. And it's fascinating that all of us as human beings, it's hardwired in us. Like we respond to that. It's the same way, and this is kind of heading off in a different topic, Uh, It's the same way we respond to nature. So if you walk outside, your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down, and you immediately respond to the nature around you. You don't have to think about it, your body responds. Pretty fascinating. And part of restorative environmental theory, which I won't go into because that's part of my dissertation and you'll just have to go read it someday, um, is really looking at that prospect of how we regenerate. And part of the restoration process, and this is psychology and clinical folks, the last stage in restoration is connecting to something larger than yourself, is connecting to a larger universe. Now, for many of us, that may be God, (laughs) right. And for others, it may just be the, the nature and the restored environment itself and that idea that there must be something amazingly powerful as I'm standing in front of this waterfall. And 78% of us go to water for vacations, by the way. Nobody says, I'm going to take a vacation and and stay at a hotel and look at a brick wall. Where do we go? We go to mountains and we go to water. We all do it. So it's interesting when we start to think about how we understand and interpret our world and how our brain responds to it. And it all comes back to that same idea of I need to find a higher calling. I need to find a higher connection. I have to create meaning or I don't know why I get up in the morning. And that's part of what we do in therapy every day is understanding narrative. What is my story? And how do I shape my story? And often I'll say to students, you're an autonomous adult. You get to decide today what your story is. You get to change that story. So if you want to take a left, take a left. You don't have to keep going right just because that's what you've done your whole life. And so that idea of trying on new experiences and trying new voices, that's part of what we do in college. That's part of that transition. But I would encourage you to think it doesn't end. Like that definition of who I am, if you ask me at 25 who I am, you're gonna get one answer. If you ask me at 50, you get a different answer. If you ask me at 80, there's a different answer. 
because this is a journey, not an event. But hopefully the bottom line is you stay true to that core and you stay true to that reflection. So when, like when I graduated from college, um, I found myself a lot of times, and some of you can exp we'll, we'll think about this, you'll go out on a Friday night and be at a house hanging out with folks and people you don't know and they'll be, all be introducing themselves. And they'll be essentially in quick terms when you shake hands with somebody, they'll be telling their story. What are always the things that they say? They'll say where they work or where they went to college or where they grew up. Where they grew up. And essentially they're trying to tell a story about who they are. Here's what's interesting to me is that they're always typically about external factors. They're like things like what I hear under the surface when someone says, I work at, at such and such a place and I went to such and such a college, they're often saying, I matter because I went to these places. You ever hear that? Like, this is why I matter. What's, I think, fascinating from what we've seen and from each side of our research is that when you get your self-worth and your self-esteem, which means self-estimation, your identity, from places of external, external factors that they lead you to be pretty hollow after a while. Um, we had some statistics that we pulled together. Uh, these are pretty interesting. Um, 80% of people find their worth validated by grades. These are questions of college students. 66% 60 uh, find their uh, self-esteem or self-worth in doing better than others. 65% find it in their appearance. And of those 65%, 70% of those are women. So what are the stories that we're telling ourselves all the time of who we are? The ones that end up leading, uh, leading us to be pretty hollow after a while because they don't last. Um, and more importantly, they don't resonate with us, with our soul, with who we are. And so there's always that hungering for why don't I feel like enough? And part of that is because you're getting your definition of self from outside of you. You are enough when you create your definition within yourself. So it's a way to think about it. So if you look at your notes that you're saying about who you are, what's the story you tell yourself? Um, the other thing I think is so fascinating about how a life of faith can change who you are from your brain all the way through you. And this is what we've seen for us, is the kind of God that you pray to, the kind of God you worship, will create the kind of person you become. If the center of your life is money, that becomes your God, that'll shape you. If the center of your life becomes an unconditional kind of love, that will shape you. So what are you going to worship? What is the story you're going to have on top of yours? Uh, this brings me back to uh, this, I'm going to show you this image in a little bit, don't hit it yet. Um, this this psalm, we, psalm we had, Psalm 139. Um, I think of y'all often when I think of this psalm and all that y'all go through. Especially on a week like we've had this week, too, with surely the darkness shall cover me, if I say that, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. But then this is how the, the psalm ends. For, or this is the middle of it. For it was you that formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. Fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist has an idea of who they are because of the kind of God that has shaped them and known them. Um, so if you're a, a, a freshman or sophomore, you probably don't know this, but uh, a few years ago um, when my wife and I were pregnant, we had a pretty tough pregnancy, and our boys, and some of you may know that we're, uh, my wife were expecting again, um, our boys came pretty early. And everything looked fine at first when they were born, uh, but then both of them started to turn kind of gray and they weren't getting oxygen. And so I made sure Dorset was okay, and then I ran off to see the boys in the NICU. And when I got there, they looked like this. And I, um, <laughs> I looked at this again the other day, and I, 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 I burst into tears. And were the, there was these nurses that came around and started, <laughs> started holding me. And, um, he was on this breathing tube, both of them, pushing air into their lungs. And there, he's pink, which is a good thing, but it was this realization that so much was beyond my control. There was nothing I could do for him. I couldn't control anything that was happening to him or in that room. And it was very clear that I've never seen anything so fragile and so beautiful in all my life. 
And in that time, I heard this prayer, this psalm. For it was you who formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Have you ever seen anything so fearfully and wonderfully made? Anything so fragile and beautiful? And that's all of you. For you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're fragile and beautiful. Can that be part of your story? Would you go to the next slide? This is what they look like now, though. <laughs> What's really interesting is all of us love our birth stories. I mean, you probably know the story of your birth. You probably know if you were born in a snowstorm or if you were born at home or if you were early because we all crave, especially as young children, those birth stories. And so it's interesting to think about your guys. Look at them today with their construction hats and everything. Yeah. It looks good on me, too. <laughs> yeah, it works. Uh, it works, yeah. Here's the point from that psalm for me, though, is that if you forget your story, and this time of your life, you may forget your story. You may try on different stories. You may try, you may try to use paths that aren't your path because you're trying to remember who you are. What worship is at the end of the day, what we come here to do, is not simply finding oneself. It's remembering who we are. And if we can't remember that sometimes, what a psalm like this does helps us remind us that God knows who we are. It's God who has searched us and known us, who has made us who we are. So I know we're going over time, so I, I want to leave this with you. This is why I think Jesus makes all the difference for me in my life. Is that when you look at the scriptures, when you look at someone like Jesus, up to that time when people thought of who God was, God was somebody aloof and somebody, and somebody who would play tricks on humanity, and still people think of God this way today, somebody who causes disasters and stuff like that. But when you look at who Jesus is, and says, this is what God is like. It's someone who comes to the least of these, and the brokenhearted, and the one who's in the most broken places and says, there's nothing so awful that I can't be a part of that. And it's that kind of story, if you let it get inside your head, can reshape all your stories. You can be fragile, but you can practice resurrection. Like, you can feel like you're hollow at times, but you can also be filled with holiness. You can have the mind of Christ, though you might feel so far away. I think his story reshapes our stories if we let it. And we might become a new kind of people and a new kind of story. Thank you. Thank you for having me the last three weeks. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah. It's been so much fun to have you. Hey guys, um, would you guys please stand and sing with us? We're going to sing a song called Forever Rain. And what we're going to do is I'm going to sing the chorus once for you guys, and then I'm going to invite you all to sing it with me so that we all learn the chorus together. Then we'll start the song. Oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever rain all right so now you're gonna sing with me ready oh i'm running to your arms i'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in your death 
there's lostness day. Sing it out. Oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your find the hand of someone next to you? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may our thoughts become your thoughts. May the darkness in this world be flooded with your light, and may it begin in this place. May our broken stories be made whole by your great love, that we may run to you and find your embrace, and that our stories be flooded with your great story of love and compassion that changes everything. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I will raise you up on eagle's wings. Oh.